Chubbs, Popcorn Junkies here. How are you all? Mum, you've combed your hair. I've combed my hair with my smallest brush in the world. Oh, is that a dog tooth brush? Uh. Popcorn Junkies here, reviewing um, Poor Things. So Poor Things is the new film by Yorgos Lanthimos. I love that name. It's a brilliant name, isn't it? Yorgos Lanthimos. He is a Greek director. Um, he came to fame, really, with Dogtooth. That was the first film I came across with him. A curious film that when I, th when I think back to it, it was sort of set within a compound. It was about a family. I seem to remember them feeling, it seemed feral. Uh, he did Dogtooth. He did The Lobster. Uh, he did uh, with uh, Colin uh, Farrell, was it? Yeah, Colin oh, Farrell. Okay. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, he did um, Killing, Killing of a Sacred Heart. Sacred Deer. Deer. Sacred, <laughs> Sacred Heart. Heart. Um, and also, of course, a couple of years ago, three years ago, four years ago, even now, he did The Favourite, which was our favourite yes, film of yes, the year that yes. The Favourite came out. Yes. This is based on a book by Alastair Gray. Alice, Who is? Alastair Gray. Alastair Gray, yeah. Scottish. He's one of Scotland's big, big, big figures. But he writes about He's Scotland. Dead. He is dead now, but I mean, yeah. he was so sort of revered. Yeah. And uh, and I was reading uh, Lathimos, Lathimos, Lathimos. Lanthimos. And he said it's all set in Glasgow, and he didn't feel that he could do justice to that, so he set yeah. it where he set it. What they're describing, they're describing as science fiction, science fantasy black comedy film, but I, I would also describe it as a sort of, I was saying to you, Victorian steampunk fantasy magic realist surreal film it's a real film it is surreal i mean it stops i'd never heard of this steampunk thing so i had to ask mark for a, a i love it as an idea steampunk it's the idea that you have explain to people well steampunk is this idea it's fictionalized obviously because it didn't happen but it's the idea of parking an element of sci-fi within the victorian era utilizing steam driven technology which was a defining feature of the times. The physics, I'm not too sure about, but yeah, this, but it has a certain look. It has a real kind of feel. You know, you often get lots of zeppelins, and you get, st and it's, and it's kind of. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Alita, that that the oh, angel, that, that, that yes, film yes, by James yes, Cameron was yeah. was a bit steampunky too. Oh, so okay. it's a whole kind of genre, science, fan, uh, science fiction, fantasy genre. It stars Emma Stone. It stars Mark Ruffalo. It stars Willem Dafoe. Um, it's got a whole host of other supporting uh, members. Rami, 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 Rami Youssef is in there. Christopher Abbott, Catherine Hunter. It's a fabulous ensemble cast, but it really much, pretty much pivots around the story principally of Emma Stone on her journey into, well, it, well what, okay. Well, before we get into what it's about yeah. and how you would even describe yeah. it, how did you feel going in, Mum? I was sort of slightly excited. Were you? Uh, slightly, because I really like the well. Everybody that I know like really like the favourite. Yeah. But um. But then again, I know you don't do this because you see films once, don't you? But I usually see films more than once pretty quickly. And I remember I didn't for the favourite, and so I thought, I wonder if it's because it was quite rich. Yeah, yeah. But I thought I have no idea. I knew the cast. I thought mm. the cast looks good. I'd had forgotten, but as soon as it started, I knew it was based on Frankenstein, and I adore that. Yeah, you're you a big know. fan of the whole Frankensteinian thing. Absolutely huge. What huge. is it about that that you like more? Well, because when you think about it, it's fundamental creating a human brain. All this horror stuff that from today, mm. almost, is based on that idea. Well, I think what fascinates me about the Frankensteinian idea, and Frankenstein isn't just, it kind of creeps into AI, it creeps into X. Creeps you know. into so many well, things. Well, yeah, it's the idea of the human creator as God. Yeah, exactly. Isn't it? I think exactly. that it's almost, I mean, lots of people get obsessed with the monster, but, but for me, the really interesting aspect of it is the kind of spiritual, where does person come from? Yes. And who's in yes. control of that? You can so see yeah. the idea. I mean, it's not a surprise, is it, that we came up with the idea? Absolutely. It's much richer in a weird way, ironically, than many of the kind of Hollywood iterations of Frankenstein have been. But anyway, okay, so this is a Frank this is a Frankenstein film. If I'm honest, I went into this with a hugely heavy heart. Oh, I had did a, you? I had a mounting throat that was diabolical. I was tired. I was I was lonely. I was hungry. He was uh, with his mother, so yeah, I don't know yeah. why he felt all these but, things. But also, I knew, I knew it was not only two hours. I think it's an hour and it's two and a half hours almost. I didn't know that. Um, and I. I loved the favourite, but I didn't know whether I had the energy or the inclination or the capacity to go as far as that sort of filmmaking needed me, which is awful because I, I love films. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, yeah. But I only mean that like you on, were tired, yeah, on the day in question. I desperately wanted to see this film. But also I've seen I've seen such polarizing reports about this where people said if those who hate it hate it and those who, who like it like it for all the wrong reasons. And I'd also read reports that the British Board of Film Classification had had to really get their, to yeah, get their it, scissors yeah. out and cut out some really quite saucy scenes. So it's quite a sexy film. It's an 18 certificate. So be warned, if you go and see it, it there's a lot of sex. explicit sex and um, pretty, pretty negative portrayal of men. Pretty accurate portrayal, but pretty negative portrayal of men. And then it started. Yes. <laughs> um, and I think, I think it's fair to say that he, he utilised a whole sort of 
So he uses the same sort of lens choices that he used in the favorite. A lot of fisheye angle lenses, a lot of black and white footage, a lot of, C, a lot of not sepia, it's not actually sepia tone. I think it's a particular rare form of Kodak ectotrone gorgeous, film gorgeous that he used looking. for some of the color sequences. So from the get-go, it has a surrealist aspect to it, so that any pans or tilt, you know, the, the, the edges of frame are whipping because you've got that fisheye effect. You know, if you have a GoPro and you kind of do all of that sort of stuff, it, it has that element to it. And yet at the centre of it, there's this, you know, you start, we start quite quickly, don't we? With clearly a character who's yeah. simple in some capacity, Emma. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew that it was based on the Frankensteinian sort of idea, right. but the moment it started, I thought, I, the look of it from start to finish, I absolutely adored. I was, in my mind, I was thinking this man is a master. Oh, absolutely. Um, but. Whenever, well, his set design, his production design, design team. Production oh, and, and interestingly, his, I mean, obviously there was some CGI because there were sort of like seascapes yeah, and skyscapes. Yeah, yeah. But apparently every one of those interiors that we were in, every single one of them was built. Yeah, there were studios built. Yeah, yeah, I read that. Got a flipping out Wonka, which we quite enjoyed. Could yeah. learn something from that. Yeah, true, true. I mean, I must admit, the moment it started and I saw that it was an old man with a young girl, I mean, one starts to think there's lots of sex in it. We know that from the, the studio. I was worried. I thought, oh my God, Will, and what, what you know, what's going to happen here? He's going to get his willy out. Well, it could have done. Could and he have. has done in other films. <laughs> has he? Yes. I can't remember. Yeah, that one with Lars von Trier. I remember that. Yeah. But anyway, anyway. He's, uh, he's, face, he's the Frank, he's Frankenstein and he's made a monster. That's Well, he's made a young girl. Well, and spoiler, 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 and this is a spoiler, but he's made a monster in the most curious of fashions. He's, he's made a monster from, uh, she killed us, tried to kill herself or went to kill herself. Uh, he pulls the body, um, he, she's pregnant and dying or dead, takes her brain out, saves the baby, takes the baby's brain out, hurls the baby away, puts the baby's brain in her and thus we have uh, a relatively simple woman because yeah. she's in a woman's body with the brain of a well, a, a, a fetus, an infant, a baby. Yeah. So I mean, I, but, I mean, the film works on the premise. You know, the start of this film, you are sitting there as a viewer trying to work out why is this woman behaving so strangely? Why is she simple? Why can't she eat? Why can't she walk? Why is she sort of mesmerised by the simplest of things? What is and who is Willem Dafoe? You know, in in relationship to her, he's obviously the scientist. You know, we've had those great shots in the Victorian kind of surgery. You know, where he's cutting things up. I think the thing that hit me most quickly was how brilliantly written this was. I mean, almost within the first nanosecond. Degree, yeah. It looked stunning. And I think with the film in this day and age, if every single frame in the first three minutes is as sensational, and you've got whip smart, and, and I'm whip talking smart. whip smart. Yeah. It, who's the script writer? Tony McNamara. Absolutely, sen oh, wrote the favourite too. Sensational yeah. script work. And it continues all the way all through the, the way film. Through. Often if you get that smarter script, it tails off because they can't All you kept whispering in my, in my ear almost after 15 minutes was, where can it go? <laughs> where is it going to go from here? Well, that... Where is it going to go? How's it going to go? Where's it going to go? And I kept going, it's not going anywhere, Mum. It's up there. Okay. Yeah. No, I know. But I mean, but, but you're right. Fantastic. When the benchmark, when, when the, was it the benchmark? When yeah, the, the bar benchmark. is set so high so quickly, there is always that sort of it. sagging moment around sort of 30 minutes to an hour in where you think it can't keep this up at all. Let's do a little bit of a spoiler. It does. It does. It does manage to do that. It, it does. It does totally, manage. Yeah. Totally, totally. Um, I didn't know it was as long as it was and I didn't think it was that long even, even at the very end. No. It flew by for me. Now I was trying to look at this through the eyes of someone who isn't into, do you have to be, would you say even after the first half hour, do you have to be willing to accept adventurous filmmaking to enjoy this yeah i think you do yeah you do i think some people could watch this and just go oh this is just being weird for the sake of being weird because i think any character like emma stone you know playing a character like she does and she's deeply simple and odd and she's having to play but it's very difficult to access a character yeah immediately yeah, like that without yeah. you thinking mm, well, well yes but at the same time the fact that although i'm contradicting myself because yes. i didn't know that this was I love the a first, contradiction, though. that this was that she was the, the brain of her unborn child if you like but um, no, I mean, because it is based on the Frankenstein thing, I think people would accept that more than most, than yes. most, because they know in a way where it's going. We know, for example, that she calls her creator God, God. but she could as well call him Pa. I mm. mean, she could as well, you know. But I love the fact that the detail of his name, God, is that he's called Godwin. Yes. Which is yeah. quite neat. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so Willem Dafoe, and you're right, I, I felt I, I was spending the first 15 minutes oscillating between, oh, is Willem Dafoe just a dirty old bastard? Yeah. Because his face is literally a jigsaw. I mean, everybody get the full. Fantastic. I mean, fantastic prosthetics. I mean, I mean, Will, Willem Dafoe has got a, an amazing face anyway, yeah. craggy to die. Quite dynamic for. to make but it I even mean, more every amazing. Every line was just slightly off. It was yeah. just incredible. Yeah. And then there's a moment quite early on. So I think it's a really good grab if you're going to go and see this. And we haven't really done a spoiler yet. If you. 
we're going to we're going to spoil this now so oh. you might want to head off but before you, you do head off the best bit of advice is go into this expecting a frankenstein film and it will yeah. get you through yeah what might be lumpy for you it wasn't for me but it might get you through the bumps and, and, yeah. and yeah, of, I agree you know with quibbles of getting into the into the film but really i spent most of the front of the film trying to ascertain and work out what willem dafoe's yeah yeah access point with her was what the point of him was it gives you more access to the whole film if you know that you, you recognize yeah. that she's learning as from an infant onwards. So what did you make of, of okay, so let's put this in the, in the simplest of terms. So really it's a rites of passage film yeah. of Emma Stone, Frankenstein's monster, essentially discovering herself and because she's got a fully grown woman's body, right up front in many of those discovery points yeah. is sex and the satisfaction of the body. Yeah. So, that, so that's why it's quite a sexy film because she hits upon, you know, her bits quite early on and discovers well, why, why the hell isn't everyone doing this all the time? I mean, thing. we do in a way go through before that, even mm. though she's hardly got any language and she's more like an infant, mm. don't you think? But then very rapidly she goes into puberty and she discovers and then you start to think, oh yeah. my God. I mean, some of those scenes were amazing. It must have been so difficult to act. It's I mean, the whole thing must have been so difficult to difficult act. Difficult to act. But also the script was incredibly clever because of course her language is incredibly primitive and baby and stupid and, and crude. Yeah. Um, and yet within it, there was a sort of Shakespeare and magic. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm such a librarian at heart, but I love the fact that when she was learning language mm. in the beginning, she'd say three or four words meaning one word, which mm. is as if she'd learned from a thesaurus. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. What, but her reference to sex was jumping furiously. Jumping furiously. Yeah, you could jump furiously that. on my genital bits. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, somehow it takes all the all the fear out of it. Absolutely. It? And so what we discover is so so really th that's what the whole film that's the arc of the film is across various chapters. We follow her life, and it, it's well that's what I like about it. It's and a, she but, makes her own way really. yeah it's an alternative female rights of passage story now i can well imagine that a number of people it's a very feminist film but i can well it imagine is, it is subs. yeah a number of people having a real issue with the fact that the director's a man and that the writer's a man um, it is produced, co-produced by Emma Stone too. So I think one mustn't ever forget the input that actresses and actors have yeah, on a role. Yeah. They're not going to just sign up to some kind of jaundiced male perspective. No, so no. I, don't, I don't think we can just say, oh, they wrote it, so it's a male view. But it is a very, it is a feminist film. This, yeah. is, this is a film about a woman who passes through countless different types of men yeah. and relationships doesn't yeah. she and we get four i think across oh, the okay. film okay i'm not sure how many but because it, well let's start with william defoe so we've got the parental god like yeah. character yeah. who thank god doesn't have a sexual no he's a fatherly figure <sighs> i was worried though no, i was no you know this film's willing to go to places you know how can you not yeah and so i thought his relationship with her was fascinating and his yeah. desire to sort of recreate her but my god he was funny wasn't he? His delivery of certain lines was yeah. just, uh, how would you describe I it? I don't know, but it's, they were sort of serious, but at the same time, so hysterically funny as he said them. Yes. That, I mean, it's difficult to put your finger on it, isn't it? This film had that capacity with every single character you met, and I was saying this as we came out, where every time you left a character and you went back to them, you were, joy, you were overjoyed yes. to return to them. There wasn't that thing of, you know in a film when you've got two or three different storylines yes. and you're cross-cutting, yes. or characters, and you're like, oh right, well we're back with this. There's always one that you're like, okay, we've got to get through this, but I want to get back to the interesting bit. Yeah. Every time we came back to whoever we came back to, it was fascinating. Um, so in a sense we had the control. So Emma Stone's character all the way through it discovers that, that, that men are really only interested in caging her. So the first act is very much, in a sense, um, Willem Dafoe trying to con constrain and contain her from a parental perspective. He's worried about the outside world. We've got the moment where I thought you were going to have a heart attack with laughter. When they head out into the world oh, on a horse-drawn carriage. To tell, to tell people. Okay, well, just check out the horse-drawn carriage. Carriage of Willem Dafoe. Uh, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I thought you were going to die. I thought we were going to have to get CP CPR. Is that what it is? Yeah. CPR? Yeah, for the CGE. Yes. For the, the CGE. <laughs> have, you done, have you taken the CSE? <laughs> oh, Mark, that was funny. It was funny. Um, but so, so he's trying to protect from the outside world. Then he brings he brings a sort of hapless student, science student in. Oh, yes, of course. I'm forgetting the hapless yeah, student. Yeah, pr brilliantly played by Rami Youssef, who, oh, adorable. Yeah, adorable. He's a, he's an acolyte of William Dafoe, isn't Absolutely. he? Absolutely. He, 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 but he's brought him in because he's thick. Yes, ostensibly, <laughs> but also in all the sort of students that sit around and watch him dissecting people, he's the one that William Dafoe can do no wrong. He yeah, absolutely, absolutely supports him. And William Dafoe knows that, yeah. so he has him in as a... Yeah. So he sort of brings him in to kind of research and sort of monitor how Emma Stone's going along, but really he's brought him in to become her safe love interest. So you've had Willem Dafoe trying to control her, trying to keep her within this gilded cage of his home, even within a horse-drawn carriage, horse-drawn carriage. Um, and then he brings in Rami Youssef, who's this kind of love interest, a safe love interest. And yeah. Think, okay, great. And he's 
she's nice, isn't she? She's lovely. And quite quickly, she she's bored. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when Defoe tells the students, I mean, the, the reason he gives them is he, sa he says, keep a record of everything that she does. You need to write down everything. Yes. And, um, and dutifully, he does write down absolutely everything. Including her placing he? an apple up her vagina. Yes, yes, that's true. Does all sorts of things. And then he touches the woman's hairy business. He does, doesn't he? She that? does. Oh, Emma she Stone says, grabs yeah, she up, she's touched my hairy business. Anyway, so, so <laughs> she, her burgeoning sexuality is starting. Um, and then Willem Dafoe brings in, uh, then a third man comes in, Mark Ruffalo. And really, Mark, Mark Ruffalo is, is just, oh, I don't know what to say. It's, I have never seen such a funny, funny everything and such an against type. I mean, I mean, he plays a certain type of part, which is essentially usually serious. And this was so far from serious with a... He, with a an incredible English accent. Yeah. Buttoned which, up. Which, though, even when he was kind of losing that accent, yeah. was in keeping with the aesthetic of the film. Yeah. Because the whole film was sort of creaking at the edges of surrealism. And you're sort of thinking, well, what, what have we been asked? Anyway, he's a rakish cad of a man who immediately touches her hairy, hairy business. business. <laughs> and she suddenly is like, what the hell? There's a whole world of experience that, that old Mark Ruffalo is introducing her to. And we have a lot of kind of made of this kind of very fun. They elope, don't they? They go to Lisbon and suddenly she's free. And Willem Dafoe was saying you can go. But then suddenly Mark Ruffalo is threatened by her her sexual appetite. Yeah. Um, which, yeah. which just knows no bounds. Yeah. On the way, there's a dance scene, so which is oh so funny God. it it borders on i mean absolute again i nearly died with laughter i mean mark ruffalo that she does all the time and we'll talk about emma stone as an actress mm. later i think because she's on screen the whole time she is literally, yeah. but he so plays against type and so, it's so funny mm. that it's almost i had to watch the whole film through fingers you know because it was so hysterically funny i found, i mean i found him a i think some people might not do you? Yeah, I think some people might find him a bit mannered. I was trying to look at this because it's one of those films where you can you can run the risk of coming out, which I've already done, and say to everyone, oh my God, you've got to see this film. It's just amazing. Yeah, that's true. And then I've everyone goes in and they go, yeah, it's all right. It's a bit weird, isn't it? And it's, look, it is weird. I didn't think he could out-weird this. I didn't think this director would be able to out-weird the favourite. No. I mean, there's a way of admiring a film without liking it. And I think that yes. maybe quite a few people will do that. Because mm. there's no way that you can't think of the sets are beautiful. Mm. I mean, we haven't even mentioned the music, which is astonishing. Mm. Which, which, which is out of tune it. most of the time. But that isn't that, couldn't that be defined as steampunk? Yeah, it well, yeah, sounds absolutely. like the bellows of a radiator or something. I thought it was brilliantly counterintuitive as well. I mean, you know, you get, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the Maddie often shows these memes where you'll see someone striving for some kind of Instagram perfection. Yeah. And then suddenly the music goes into sort of badly played violin as if it's yeah. like a catastrophe. This film has that all the way through it. Um, so that you're almost wincing at parts. Well, you wince. I was wincing a lot throughout this, but wincing and laughing hysterically. And me, so. And even the sex wasn't... I, didn't, I was expecting it to be really oh, offensive. There was one moment with a particularly creepy man who was like a crab. Yes. He was a bit odd, and that was all a bit odd. But what was funny about even that was they didn't give us too much context or detail. No. So you just thought, whoa, that's what weird. What was clever as well, I mean, I suppose there's a way of being critical of that, because maybe he wasn't completely woke in that, in that mm. instance. But he focused on the faces of the men, and the mm. faces were so weird yes. that you didn't really need that extra extra. But it's weirdness. very awkward. I mean, I can see Nadia absolutely squealing and going, oh, especially with the first guy that she had sex with in a brothel. Anyway, you know, so they, they go on a boat, so they've been to Lisbon, then they head off somewhere else. They go to Marseille or Paris or somewhere. Then they suddenly find that they've got no money. And, and then she and then she has to get money, so she goes into a brothel. She realises that she, this thing that she loves... Sex. Can, yeah, sex. The jumping up and down vigorously business. On a hairy business. On a hairy business. Is that she can make money out of it. And then once she realises that, she and Mark Ruffalo have completely run out. Mark mm. Ruffalo has gone off to... I mean, he's a big baby. He goes off Well, to, what's lovely about this is she, through no... What, getting into the kind of... So the plot moves along those lines. Yeah. And we won't ruin the end, because no, the, no. the end is bizarre. But it does involve all that sort of actually Shakespearean stuff of mistaken identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing that you were saying, so let's not forget Emma Stone was a woman who threw herself off a bridge. Okay, she's got the brain of her dead, of her baby, but she was, the physicality of the woman, there are a few clues in the film, is still a woman that people remember. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a call out on her, especially by the actor Christopher Abbott, who crops up towards the end, which, is, and I thought he was excellent. He was. Very it's hard to come into a film for the last 15 not minutes. not given a lot to do. But, but then yeah. he had to really anchor that. He did. Of, and I think he did a really good job. That was beautifully written, his mm -hmm. heart, didn't you think? A I mean, often what writers do is when somebody, as you say, when somebody comes in at the end and you've had such strong performances mm. and writing, mm. it can be off slightly. But that was fantastic. You almost felt you were starting to get another film. Yeah, I did. So what? So and so, you know, she goes into brothel. She, she kind of and she 
she curates her own freedom, doesn't yeah. she, financially, and she sort of builds, and she keeps, and she keeps growing. I tell you what, it reminded me of at one point in a weird way. I don't know if you ever remember. Is it Annie Hall or one of those Woody Allen films where he? I can't remember which one it is. Where he's sort of erudite and he reads books and he sees That's, films. Yeah, it is Annie Hall, I think. And then he introduces his girlfriend Diane Keaton to all this stuff, and she sort of enjoys it more than him and it becomes not that you become better at being cultured but she gets it more and she's into it more and she supersedes him and he's left behind and yeah. he's like and she meets someone else who's a writer i kind of was getting that sort of vibe where what this is about is how she she because she just doesn't because she's arrived in a fully formed woman's body and hasn't been culturally defined yeah by the whole nurture thing of what how women are controlled and her, she hasn't been defined by women's limitations exactly so what we get ironically in this film and i think emma stone does an astonishing job of portraying I this do. is pure woman just having what she wants and it wasn't and she's 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 asking about morality and sympathy and empathy she asks about caring yeah you know, there's, d there's discussions in here about feeling stuff yeah but she's also aware that these men who are trying to control her make her feel cold things and yeah, make her feel horrible yeah, things yeah. and hard things she's and told all the time that whatever she's doing you know if it's bodily functions or certain sort of mannerisms that it's not you can't do it in polite society yes. and she takes that mm. but then sort of that's challenged as she goes on isn't yeah, it yeah, she yeah. realizes and i think what's nice about this film is this this then becomes a portrait of a woman absolutely going for stuff as if she was in a ready formed body that can enjoy itself which you could argue is what men men get the yeah. opportunity to do yeah. throughout, throughout childhood and then as an adult too yeah yeah you know um and and what we see is the carnage and the falling apart and the challenge to all those men around her yeah. for not always bad reasons no. of wanting to control her. So like Rami, you know, the, the, the soppy guy who's, who's betrothed her, he's, he's kind, he's not yeah. a horrible man. And, her, and, and William Dafoe is kind in, yeah. in a curious way. Yeah, and he remains kind thing. all the way through, doesn't yeah. he? When she goes home to sort of seek him as you would do your father, yeah. he's kind to her. Yeah, whereas, you know, whereas the Mark Ruffalo character and her ex-husband or, you know, husband, uh, Chris, played by Christopher Abbott, aren't kind. And so, you, yeah. Yeah. you know, very unkind. Yeah. Um, so what do you think it was saying about feminist politics and all the rest of it? Well, I think, I mean, I start, I think I just touched on it just then because I think being a woman without limitations is important because mm. women are brought up to think, to think of their limitations. And interestingly, I mean, whatever I thought, and it, I went in and out of liking and not liking Barbie. Mm. The, the thing I like the best about the movie Barbie is the very last line where she sort of says, after everything that she's done, she says, oh, well, I'll go off and get an appointment with a doctor. Mm. I mean, women are born knowing, mm. and certainly go through puberty, knowing they are victims of their body. Yeah. And in that respect, I think what he tried to do brilliantly, and maybe, the, maybe she did have a hand in the writing of mm. it, we show that left to their own devices and all things being equal, there is no limitation mm. on what she could want. You know, mm. she can feel sexual feelings. She, she can describe them in exactly the same way mm. as the men do. Mm. And in fact, she outdoes the men, doesn't she, in all those terms? I thought it was really, I think it's an interesting counterpoint, actually, to Barbie, because if you think yeah, of what... Yeah, I thought that. Yeah, if you think of Margot Robbie's character as Barbie in Barbie, she is a doll that's been, you know, to what extent has she been conditioned and when she becomes human, hasn't she been conditioned and is that liberating or limiting this is about the same thing in a weird way i mean emma stone is like a barbie doll because she's been created hasn't exactly she? she's been made. exactly and she's been made but she's been by plonking by plonking her learning process in a fully formed, formed body really this is a film it is a rites of passage film but it's a rites of passage film that doesn't have to go through the conditioning that is the rites of passage for women yeah. in a child's body. Yeah, yeah. You know, as they grow up. Yeah. So in a sense, what Willem Dafoe has actually done with her baby has liberated it from the conditioning of society. Yeah. So it's an emancipation, Yeah. if you like, a suffragette emancipation of the unborn child within her. Yeah, I mean, very true. I mean, it's a revelation, this film, in that respect, because it does make you realise that left alone, mm without the con conditioning, which you can't, uh, you know, you can't, mm. you can't ever take away the conditioning because it's there from the moment mm. you're born and you're not even aware of it. Mm. But you can't be yourself because the, you're constrained, constrained, constrained. And in this film, she is only constrained by the stupidity of the men she's around. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's incredibly funny. So funny, I thought I was gonna die. I mean, I've, we were both laughing something. There were people in the cinema laughing out loud. It was like, 
it was just so funny. It was funny about men. There's a really that exchange between Mark Ruffalo and her about him wanting her wanting sex more and more and him dawning on him the limitations of yeah, the man. Yeah. You know, lots of very witty commentary, uh, moments of, that comment on, on, on what it means to be a man and all that kind of stuff. And then there's moments of such surrealism and, and, and deep humour. Like there's a moment where someone asks Willem Dafoe's character whether he could feel any kind of arousal. And he said, due to some operation that his father had done on him, it would take the electri electrical current and power of all of North London for him to get an erection I and know. generate... Sp and you're thinking, there's some, some of the most elaborate thoughts and ideas and surrealist ideas. It's entertaining. It's funny. It's saucy. Yeah. It's, there's yeah. a bawdy sauce to it all. Yeah. There's something very attractive about watching this woman being in total control. And she was, what was interesting as well, she, was, she wasn't exploiting anyone. So when she was walking towards the end of the film saying to her husband, so you don't have any issue with the fact that I've slept with this person, I've done this and I've taken a, I've done jumpy, jumpy physical things all over someone's hairy business. And you're thinking, well, that sort of slightly dispassionate attitude, yeah, why should anyone have a problem with this kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah. It was weird, it was incredibly thought provoking and entertaining. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. So Emma Stone, what about a shout out for her? Well, I mean, she's on screen from beginning to end. She she goes through a character changing that we, we've described, like going from an mm. infant. Her, the business of being a child and growing up to puberty is, is rushed over a bit, but I mean, plenty of time in a way until she reaches the stage where she recognizes what her hairy business is for. <laughs> and then it sort of goes into gear mm. and um, also, let me say this, it was clear, I mean, people could feel, and I felt this a bit, when you get an older man and a man that's so sort of in everything, Willem Dafoe, and he's creating her, and you get slightly worried that they're mm. sharing a bed at one point because he's got mm. his arms around her, he's being a fatherly figure, you slightly worry the way the film is going to go. Mm. But I have to say that, um, uh, what's her name? Emma Stone. Emma Stone obviously completely trusted yes. the director yeah, yeah. because um, she, she goes for it, but she goes for it in a, not just a liberated way, mm. but an amusing way. And uh, and I kept thinking she clearly really trusts him. Well, I thought he also did a very clever job of it didn't objectify her. And there's a lot of no. nudity, there's a lot of sex. We see all of Emma Stone in varying different ways. And it's not to say there weren't moments that were perhaps titillating or whatever, but it never felt exploitative, no. even though she was being essentially exploited in a weird way it just she did such a successful job of being in control yeah that you 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 bought that she was yeah. you know even when there were these sort of horrible predatory men in the brothel you thought well she's got she's got one up on them yeah they're the, they're yeah. the absolute hopeless cases you know yeah uh, you know men were reduced to infants and they're reduced to far more in the final final scene of the film yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it makes you think about so many things because it makes you realize that exploitation of somebody we mm. could say the whole female sex is exploitation exploited up to a point by men time, yeah. is 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 impossible if you refuse to be exploited if you refuse to recognize that as mm. an idea mm. and that's what she does mm. i mean women try and as we go in and out of history women try hard i mean we did it when i in, mm. in the 70s to define their own future sexuality whatever but it but it's it's too difficult they keep banging their head against a brick wall so i would say this film is, is about or trying is, in a weird way is about a strange it's interesting the same stuff as barbie really I mean, yeah I think, well i you know, kept thinking of that last line in barbie which was by far my favorite mm. and in a way he's dealing with the same stuff mm -hmm. does it matter that it's a man directing and a no, man who's written no it would do if one felt for any any length of time or any moment that she was doing something under duress or that she wasn't happy with mm. it but she feels like I mean, I know she's got to be directed, but she felt like she was leading the yeah. whole thing. I mean, this film's not doing at all well at the box office, and neither would Is it. it? Not? No, 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 not at all. But I mean, you know, she did win the Golden Globe. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, when you watch a, a film like Oppenheimer that's going to be garlanded, and, you know, rightly so, there's so much about it. I can see why it ticks all the white yeah, boxes. Okay. It's also a bit of a career moment, isn't it, for Christopher Nolan? So some of the awards will be acknowledging his body of work. But then you go to a character like Emma Stone, and, and, and virtually every microscopic line in this film is so well written and delivered and considered and thoughtful and thought provoking. And then you go to some of the awful, awful script writing that there was in Oppenheimer for the female characters. This was a very powerfully written um, and owned piece. And yeah. I'd love to know how much of the lines or certainly, you know, the decisions on, 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 on the performance, you know, obviously were made by Emma Stone, but how much of that was hers? Because it very much, she felt, yeah, she seemed very safe, didn't she? Yeah. Very in control. I mean, it actually makes, I've thought of another thing it makes you think about. It makes you rethink the Drac Dracula, the Frankenstein myth, because usually the monster is sort of 
you know, is fearful, is running away from people, can't mm. can't function. And in this respect, she's got totally her own agency, hasn't mm. she? Mm. When she comes into it. Yeah, but I think, yeah, exactly. And I, I, I do like, again, you're right, it, it just it opened another rich kind of uh, chamber of the Frankensteinian sort of story, yeah. which is the way in which re-looking at our values and how we treat women and, and how women are controlled. And I think what's really clever about this film is that it has four very different types of men. Yeah. And it allows us to witness four very different forms of control, if you like, um, all of which, whether they're well-meaning or not, are controlling. And, and yeah, that's very true. I hadn't thought of that, but you know, mm. with my yen all the time to classify everything, that's yeah, very true. Yeah, whether it be William Defoe's little padlock on the kind of you know the French windows, or it be you know Mark Ruffalo hurling a books out sea because he doesn't like the fact <laughs> that she's not paying him any attention. You know, I mean, again, Mark, Ruff it is laugh out loud. I mean, oh. It sounds like this is some didactic feminist kind of. It's not. Not at all. It's 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 in your face. It's shocking. It's revealing. It's bizarre. It's batshit crazy, and it's fucking funny. So how would you score it? Hundred. Hundred. Hands down, hands down, the best film if it were reviewed last year of last. It, it's the best film I've seen in a long time. Yeah, as we came out of the cinema, I said to Mark, "Well, we, we'd done the best films of the year by then, hadn't we?" Mm. And I thought, "My God, if that had come out, it would have gone straight." I seem to, to the remember top. the favourite came out at the similar time, it and, did. and as the year went on, we had to really reach back and remember it to yeah. say, "Yes, it was." So we have to remember this. This, this yeah. was our favourite. Yeah. This is a sensational movie. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It is.